right, thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Julie. Thank you very much. I think it was about three or four years ago that, uh, that we met at a conference. And I uh, very much have enjoyed our uh, interactions ever since then. Uh, very pleased to be with you today. I, I, I am very delighted to have you interrupt me as we go through. I may say something. I may be talking about something. And you're like, I don't know what he's talking about. Just, just feel free to ask. I've got six kids, so I'm used to being interrupted. So <laughs> uh, five boys, and we kept trying to have that girl. And uh, our sixth one was a girl, but we adopted her. That was how we, uh, we my, my wife knew that if we kept having kids, we were just going to keep having boys. And, so, well, all right, so yes, I'm with the O.C. Tanner Company, and uh, I'm going to be talking today about strategy deployment. Uh, a lot of people come to visit the company. We're in Salt Lake City. Uh, we manufacture there. I have the production. I have engineering, product development, uh, supply chain, logistics, and uh, facilities. And uh, uh, just a couple words about the O.C. Tanner Company. We have 55 sales offices uh, around the world, 1,700 employees. Um, 8,000 clients, mostly uh, larger uh, companies. Uh, we have about 19 million people who use our systems, uh, about half a billion dollars in, in, uh, in global revenue. Uh, we've been on the Fortune 100 uh, com best companies to work for twice, which, uh, which is very gratifying for us. And basically our business is that we help uh, the world accomplish and, and appreciate great work. Um, we provide, uh, we have a, uh, a culture building platform that uh, we, we sell to our clients to uh, help them recognize the great work of their people. And then my part of the business provides the awards that people receive uh, when they're being recognized. And about half of the revenue is uh, pure supply chain uh, procurement. I have a, a large automated warehouse and we just fulfill things like an Amazon. Well, Amazon's trying to copy us, which is okay. I, you know, <laughs> I'm all right with that. And, and we turn product around and ship it um, to our clients. And about 20% of the revenue is, is manufactured product, custom product that's designed for the client to uh, uh, something they want to use specifically uh, in their need. It's usually smaller uh, type items. And I'm going to describe that, I'm going to show you just a little bit, just so you understand uh, that as we talk about the strategy deployment. Uh, but I also want to uh, start with, with a, a couple of slides that I call kind of my credibility uh, slides. Uh, in terms of, we've been, doing, we've been doing lean manufacturing for 26 years. Uh, we actually started it just before the word lean uh, was defined. Uh, we didn't know what we were doing when we started. And, uh, but it has been very nice to us at the O.C. Tanner Company. I will tell you that uh, uh, when we first started, we, we were a big batch manufacturer. Uh, we love to do things in big lots, and now we make everything one at a time. Um, we, uh, our factory layout used to be in 28 departments on four different floors, and now we're organized into mini factories. And a mini factory basically fits into a space that's just about right here. It's in a U-shape. We issue materials. There, it comes up, it flows down, it ships out the other side. Um, every piece that we do is custom, so the route, it's not as smooth as up and down like I just said. Uh, every piece has a different routing, and it can move around the cell in different ways. Um, so the one piece flow works very well for us, because we can do uh, what, what is called hey junka, where we can smooth out the workflow by, by not just sending through the line the same piece repeatedly and have a bottleneck in one place. So. Um, uh, it used to take us 26 days from the time we issued materials until we shipped it, and now it takes us 20 minutes. Yeah, it's cool, right? I don't know. I think it's cool. Um, I used to use 6 million pieces of paper, again, because every piece was custom, and now we're paperless through, throughout our production. We have a, a little cup. Uh, or a tray that parts flow on, and embedded in the bottom of that is an RFID chip. And when the RFID chip gets on top of the Kanban uh, where it's being worked, there's a reader right there, and it pops up the display information for that station, and then also tells you what the next process is. Um, our on-time delivery used to be awful. We used to have people who all they did all day long was run around and, and find orders because we had so much whip on the floor. And of course now we don't have anybody doing that. Now if you want to expedite uh, an order, you launch it, right? Because it's going to ship 20 minutes from now, basically. Um, 
Our efficiencies quadrupled, our floor space is reduced by 70%. So our IT group, we sell software and software services, so we have about 150 people in IT, and they are, uh, so they've grown considerably in the 30 years that I've been at OC Tanner, and they're, they're in space that used to be manufacturing, appliance services in space that used to be in manufacturing. Uh, we have a whole new product that's on the mezzanine that used to be all manufacturing. We just gave up all the space for other people because we don't need it anymore. We eliminated all the extremely toxic hazardous waste we used to have. Um, uh, we did plating, so we had arsenic and lead and cyanide and sulfuric acid and so forth. We don't have any of that anymore because we, we, we had a plating room, right, with, with cinder blocks and, and, and emergency doors that slammed shut and just killed people inside the room, right, if something went wrong. Horrible situation. And uh, we wanted to have plating in the cell. Uh, once a product starts launching into a cell, it never leaves the cell. And so we had to redo all the plating so that we could put uh, that operation in there. And, and, and people who plate come to our operation, they see what we're doing, they say, you can't do that. They go, yeah, I know, that's what they say. <laughs> they say you can't do that, but, but we do it. Uh, also, our inventory turns have tripled. Uh, good on-time delivery. So uh, let me just uh, show you some of the products. This is our legacy product that we've been making for 90 years. Uh, we just celebrated our 90th birthday this year. This is a mature product, a lapel pin charm, something like that with the corporate logo in it. Uh, we used to, this used to be all we made, and now we're, we don't make as many of these. We make about 3,000 of these a day now. Uh, but we're, we're making new types of products uh, out of acrylic, out of aluminum. Uh, we're using mills, we're using cast. Um, and, and everything gets a corporate logo on it. Uh, we're also combining, we have an acrylic line, we have an aluminum line, uh, the two together with the acrylic. We have printers we print on the back, which gives you a nice image like this that means something to the client, print on the front. Uh, we also still do different products with our presses and so forth, like, like these coasters for Dow. Uh, trophy type things, these are all things that are just like this big. Right, that are meant to kind of sit on the desk and people say, that means something to me. Uh, I want that, that's cool. Um, so that's basically uh, what we're manufacturing, the way we manufacture. So just like I described the mini factory for the emblems, it's the same with uh, like the acrylic line. We have uh, you know, one of these big $80,000 mills, three actually of these big $80,000 mills and a piece of acrylic hits the mill, it cuts it out into a shape or a size, and then it flows to a polishing station, it comes around, it gets printed and, and etched, and then it goes in a shipping box and it ships. And it's a it's smaller cell, it's only about the size of this right here. Um, uh, same with the, the milled product, the aluminum product, it, it, it all, everything runs through the, through the cellular uh, idea. The, uh, the cool thing is when, um, when machine shop operators come to see our operation and they see these mills sitting Everything's on carpet. Uh, Mr. Tanner believed that beauty brings more joy to people than other human values. So uh, when you walk into the factory, uh, it looks like you feels like you're in an upscale office, really. And uh, windows all around the building, very bright, lots of natural light, and all the manufacturing is against the windows, uh, which puts my office in the middle uh, in the dark, unfortunately. But uh, that's why, so I love to go to Gemba because that's where the light is. And um, anyway, they're surprised not only to see the mill sitting on carpet, but they're surprised to see it right in the flow. And uh, you know, we used to have a machine shop, and uh, as, as the, the use for the dyes and the trims that we were making the emblems with went down, we said, well, what else can we do with these mills? And that's when we started milling the aluminum and milling the acrylic and so forth. But we basically have busted the machine shop into four different places around the campus. And uh, did the mill operators like that? No, they did not. Uh, they did not want to, they actually thought lean had passed them by, right? They thought this is, we're doing lean here. But when we took their mills and put them right in the production cell, uh, it's interesting, when they first went in there, their thought was, well, that's okay, you've got your production, I'm a mill operator. And uh, yesterday we had a group, a tour group in, and I was standing in the line, and, and the mill operator was polishing, and the, uh, a woman, who used to be up in another department was running the mill. And I love that. I love the way that kind of mixes things up. So anyway, that's, uh, that's what we do, uh, how we do it. Uh, we manufacture, I'm gonna say about 8,000 pieces a day, things like this that, that we ship uh, across, the, uh, across the country. Have a similar operation in um, uh, Toronto, 
and another one in London, uh, facilities, two facilities in India, uh, in Singapore, and two in Australia. So, yes, ma'am. The hand shoots up. I love it. Yeah. Could you please hold all questions to the end? No, I'm, I'm, I'm joking. <laughs> yes, please. What time period um, did you transform the identity to factory? How long So we, that has been, it has been literally 26 years. Yeah, I, was, I started in marketing 30 years ago, and then about four years into my career, the president of manufacturing and a couple of his VPs were retiring, and they posted a job for a, it was called director, so it was a promotion. I was like, cool, facilitator of change. I thought, well, that sounds fun, because <laughs> everyone loves change. So uh, I moved to manufacturing. Um, at the time, the only text we had was Schoenberger's book, World Class Manufacturing, and that's what our CEO handed me. And, uh, but he, he had no notion of cellular manufacturing. He didn't want that. In fact, several of our experiments that we tried uh, as many as 23 years ago, he looked at it and he was dismayed. He took it apart. Uh, so it was tough, right? It, I, was, I was fighting City Hall, uh, not just at the executive level, but nobody else wanted to do it either. Um, but now they do. Now they love it. So, so I, I mentioned the results that we've gotten. And I, and, and I think, so we get hundreds of visitors a year and uh, had about 40 yesterday uh, from all over the country. And um, I think they come to see, uh, they, they come to see the people uh, because the people are so engaged and empowered and making great things happen and they come to see strategy deployment. And, and so that's, that's, and for me, they're connected. For me, they're the same thing because the way we do strategy deployment requires engaged people because we are cascading strategy to the floor, to the team members, and they are picking up uh, the strategy and running with it. So as, as I'm gonna walk you through this today, I'm gonna describe uh, both the culture necessity and the strategy deployment. I was telling these people yesterday, they were, there, they were there for like four hours, and everyone's taking notes, they see stuff and they write it down, and I'm thinking, you know, you, you, one, you don't wanna just go do what you saw. And you likewise don't want to do what I'm showing you. You want, to, you want to think through why we did what we do and how does it apply to you. And, and I can tell you what I show you now, we'll be doing differently a year from now. So that's another reason why you don't want to do what I'm doing. You, just, you want to just understand the ideas. Uh, but I told them I'm worried that you're going to go back and think you can just apply these things. And I don't think they'll work if you don't have the right culture in place. Um, I think a lot of people try the continuous improvement tools and it falls flat and they can't figure out why it doesn't work. And I really believe, well, I'm gonna show, okay, let's go to that. Um, so we use the, we, we stumbled across the, the Shingo model uh, about three years into our journey, four years into our journey, which has value at the top. Everybody focused on creating value for the customer and uh, driving that through continuous improvement based upon a foundation of culture. And, and I believe this intensely. I believe that, I believe everyone should be driving value and I believe everyone should be doing continuous improvement every day, but I think it rests on a culture of uh, respect and, uh, and humility. Um, and this is, uh, and I think this culture piece is, is not a gimmick. I mean, you generally have to believe in your people and, and you have to have a relationship with them where they know that you, that you believe in them. Uh, part of this idea of respect every individual um, is, this, is the idea that as a leader, I am invested in your success and I'm gonna do whatever I can to develop you and teach you and, and build you up and, and help you be your best possible person. It's based upon this idea that everyone has intrinsic value and untapped potential. Everyone, everyone you see throughout your day has an edge on you somehow, right? There's something they are able to do. And sometimes it just is waiting to be untapped. It's waiting to be released. So when I think of untapped potential, I think of my seven grandchildren. And here's six of them. Uh, Eliza turns one on, on Sunday. She wasn't born yet last summer when this picture was taken. I see tremendous potential in these. And I'm not suggesting that you would think of your, your people like children. I'm just saying we ought, to, we ought to care about them the way we care about these guys. I have spent, this is, these are my five boys and my daughter on the front left there and my wife and six of my grandchildren. How much time do I spend thinking about their success? How highly invested am I 
in helping them be as good as they can possibly be because that's how I ought to be at work, right? I'm not, I shouldn't be two different people. A person at home who's, who's engaged in, in making things happen is somebody different at work who's just kind of passing through the day without interacting with the people around me. I, I think all day long it's the same thing. It's just different type of family, if you will. Okay, and then the lead with humility piece, which is also on that, that square down there, um, basically has to do with somehow getting management to the point. And we were very top-down, very autocratic. Uh, our, our leaders knew best. They were firmly in control. Um, most of our people, about half of our people didn't even speak English. Uh, we had, oh, Tana, or Salt Lake City is an international Red Cross destination, so we get a lot of refugees moving to Salt Lake. Phenomenal people, and the very best of them come work for OC Tanner. And, uh, but, but when we started our lean journey, I'm gonna say half of them didn't speak English because we didn't need it. Didn't need them to communicate. We just need them to sit down and do their job. Well, now we're trying to get them to, to, to work on strategy and make things happen. So we spent years teaching English. And, um, but we also spent years convincing management to be less controlling, less dominating. Not just less, to stop being controlling and dominating. Instead, spend their time developing and teaching and, and uh, creating capabilities in their people and getting a manager to, to feel like um, it's okay for me to be vulnerable. It's okay for me to say, you know, I don't know the answer. What do you think we should do? Even if they know the answer, to, 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 to instead think in their head, well, I know what I think, but I'm not closer to the process they are, so I'm gonna, I'm, I want to know what they think. That's, that's the change that we sought in our people, and they had to work really hard to, to do that. So, um, uh, why did I bring this up again? Oh, yeah, so I wanted to ask you, um, just, uh, just to make sure we're all on this, both on the same sheet of music here, um, in an organization that respects every individual and leads with humility the way I've described, what, what sort of behaviors would you expect from the leaders of that company? What would you expect to see? How would you expect them to behave? Anybody? An organization who, who believes that, respect for people, leading with humility. What would leaders do? Ask They'd ask questions, right? To prove their point? <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. To, to lead the witness? No, I mean, they'd ask questions because they'd want to learn, right? They want to understand. Excellent. I think you're right. What else would they do? They'd listen to people, right? Uh, they, which, again, so you ask a question, but I really want to know what you're thinking. Yeah. yeah. Good. What else would you expect to see from the leaders? They'd care. What do you mean by that, Scott? Um, you mentioned earlier they're invested in, they, they are developing, they care. They, how's your day going? How's your family? They know their people uh, very well, like a family. Yeah, and I would hope when the leader turns away and walks away, uh, what you get from the team member isn't rolling their eyes, it's, ah, those are good people. Those are good people. I'm so glad I work with them. That's what you want people to think, because they really know that they care, right? Good, I love what you're saying. Other thoughts? What else would you expect? Yeah, trust, going both ways, right? You would trust people to do their job, and I'm going to come back to that at the very end. Um, but you'd also would want people to trust the leaders too, right? Yes, sir. They focus on organizational Yeah, instead of department, gamemanship, politics, uh, getting a leg up. Everybody would have this outward mindset. Uh, what can I do to help you be successful? That would be their key to success, not how do I be successful here? Oh, you guys are awesome. Well, the others, I mean, you've, you've gone farther than I, than I was thinking. Anything else you can think? Yeah, you'd expect to see a lot of recognition, right? Leaders would, would do a lot, of, which is our business, so that's great. Please recognize, in fact, buy our products to do it. Yeah, you'd expect to see a lot of leaders saying, wow, that was awesome, and, and finding sincere ways to express that appreciation. And you'd expect them to do it in a timely manner, and you'd expect it to, do, to, to feel sincere and real. Right? People would really feel touched by it. Good. They would, right? Instead of having to put out fires all the time or racing this down or fixing that, they'd be spending their time developing people, teaching people, coaching people. Let's switch the question to the other side. What behaviors would you expect to see from team members or associates or whatever you call uh, your people 
in an organization like this? How, what would the people behave like? They would take initiative. Yeah, who said that? Yeah, they would take initiative, right? They wouldn't wait to be told, or they wouldn't say, I don't dare, or they wouldn't say, well, that's not my job, but somebody ought to do that. Yeah, they would just do it. Good. Yeah, they'd be accountable. I love that. Yeah, what else? They'd be happy to work as a team, right, with each other? Yes. Curious. Yeah, no fear. Yeah, they'd be, they'd be curious. And it would be safe to be curious. Yeah. So I'm speaking to the improvement kata there, right, to a certain extent. Good, which, which uh, uh, I'm a baby compared to, to others on the improvement kata. But we, we, we probably have, I would bet we're running about 30 different improvement kata projects in our different teams. We run them at the team level. Uh, good. I, you got it? You get, oh, you had another one? No, okay. Don't you wave your hand, because, you know, I'm going to call on you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good. Okay, so um, these cultural enablers, I believe, provide the foundation that allows continuous improvement to happen. And um, um, there are principles associated with continuous improvement. I'm going to just look at the eight ways very quickly, which I'm sure you already understand. Um, but as I talk to people, be it in manufacturing, be it in front office, accounting, uh, in sales, uh, IT, uh, I go through the eight ways and I describe them this way, physical motion that wasn't necessary, doing more than necessary, doing something again, or checking, or waving, or piles of work. Uh, everyone in every operation says, I, I like to end it by saying, I don't know, but these are kind of, maybe these are manufacturing concepts. And, and everyone, no matter where they work, goes, no, we all, we have all of those. Oh, yeah, well, let's eradicate them, right? Let's get rid of, of these wastes. So, uh, good. All right, and then, and then the, the piece right here, of course, every person doing it every day, and we focus on saving seconds and pennies. Uh, we talk to our people. Um, you know, it's interesting, when you first say to, to a team member, um, Let's save two seconds here. Let's see if you can f save some time. About seven, eight, no, maybe more like 10 years ago, our team members were saying, well, what are you talking about? All the problems are in accounting. And they're all over in marketing. You, f you go to marketing and fix these and everything will be okay. It's not us. This isn't where the opportunity is. And you ask them just for two seconds or three pennies, and, and for us, they reluctantly began doing it. And then they did the math and said, did I just save $4,000? Really? And I'm going to do that again. I just saved $2,000. Uh, yesterday, we were visiting uh, some of our teams as part of our strategy deployment walks, which I'm going to describe. And uh, uh, so a couple of them talked about big money gains. And then one of them said that she had saved, the, the, the process had saved $102.16. And I love the fact that the whole team cheered for $100 just as loudly as they did for $3,000, right? Because every, uh, every penny counts. Um, it isn't long before, uh, in our case, our team stopped worrying about everybody else and started to realize that there's, there's plenty of gains right here to be had. And I've come to believe that, that the idea of low-hanging fruit is a myth. That, uh, because every time I turn around, there's more fruit on the tree. Uh, maybe, maybe we're walking more deeply into the orchard, I don't know, but, but there always appears to me to be fruit on the tree. I guess once you get 100% value add, maybe, Maybe there's no more fruit to be picked, but uh, I know we're all a long ways from 100% value add. All right, and then of course, uh, the main point is that you're not just empowering and going after continuous improvement willy-nilly, but you're, you're aligned to creating value for the customer, uh, thinking systemically uh, with constancy of thought. And, it's, and, and so we align people several ways, and one of them is with our strategy deployment process. Um, one other last thing I will say before um, I get into the, the rest of it then, yeah, is um, we, have, we have many systems that we use to support uh, the principles I've been talking about. Like we have a coaching system, which is huge for us, where every leader sits down one-on-one -on -one with their people, including me. Uh, I sit down with my vice presidents every month and do coaching and developing and teaching. It's been very key to uh, our progress. 
But we have a 5S system, a standard work system, a visual management system, uh, and a strategy deployment system, which is one on the bottom. We probably have, we have about 15 different systems. This is just a description of some of them. And uh, we don't have a separate improvement group. We used to. We used to. But we got to the point where it felt like teams were waiting for the improvement group to give them permission or to tell them something, or they wanted their opinion, and that just kind of got tiresome. We, you know, we wanted to have the team, teams already own safety. Uh, why shouldn't they own the lean? So um, we, we ended up rolling all of the improvement system people into uh, leadership of the different teams. And so different leaders of different teams own different systems. So one of our group leaders runs our training system. Another of our group leader uh, owns the improvement system. Another of our group leaders owns 5S. Um, and uh, I own coaching and I own strategy deployment. I, I'm, I'm hanging on to that. I refuse to let them go because I care so deeply about them. Um, but the coaching has been in place for 20 years. And, uh, and it's, it's, so it's, it's old like me. And uh, we got a lot of millennials who are running our teams and so forth. And so when I, when I asked for volunteers, hey, would some of you be willing to help me update the coaching system? Eight millennials' hands shut up. And uh, they actually, we started working together and then they, they stopped letting me in the room. And uh, I, what they're doing at first was kind of scary to me, but oh, it's, it's very exciting. They're using new technology and new ideas. It's fantastic. Uh, the, the more senior group leaders aren't very happy about it. But uh, the thing that delights me is I've always been a little bit worried, well, who owns coaching when I'm dead and gone? And now I got eight millennials who have worked there for 30 years who own coaching. And, and I think that's an important part of rejuvenating our systems. All of our systems are constantly being changed, including our strategy deployment system. The, um, the, um, We've been doing strategy deployment for, uh, I'm going to say, 18, 18 years, probably. And um, we've changed it several times. Uh, about every few years, not that often, four or five years, uh, I'll just send out an email and say, hey, let's, let's sit down and let's kick around how it's going and what we can do to improve it, who wants to be involved. And uh, our strategy deployment touches uh, all of our people. I have I have like 650 people or so, um, and so uh, I always get about two dozen who want to be involved at all levels, who want to be involved with updating strategy deployment. And it takes us several sessions, you know, four hours at a time, sitting in a room, and but we always come out with a better product, always adjust it. And actually, it evolves every time we do it. We do it every six months, basically. And every time we do it, we're trying new things. Some of them work, some of them don't. When they don't work, we just don't do that again. Uh, other stuff, we just incorporate it into the next time. Sometimes we'll drop something that I didn't know if it worked or not, and people come back after and say, hey, last time we did that thing, how come we didn't do it this time? Okay, we'll, we'll put that back in. And, and, and eventually it becomes codified as, as part of the system. So, um, so let me walk you through uh, the process we use for strategy deployment. Everything up to now is just building foundation, right? So that, so that you had a, something to stand upon as I was describing this. Um, so it all begins with our corporate strategy map. And um, let me just walk you through the different elements here. So up here at the top, we've got our purpose statement, which I'll run into a little bit more in depth in a minute. Down here, we have a, a foundational culture statement. And uh, up here we have our different products, which gets updated from, from year to year. Um, this, this really doesn't change much, neither do our core strengths. And then this portion here is the part that changes every year um, with our vice presidents. Our vice presidents meet uh, every year in August to think through what needs to be the focus for, for next year. Where are we gonna apply our resources? Where do we all agree are the main things that we need to do? So before I, I get to that, let me just walk you through the, the purpose statement and the, uh, the culture statement. So at the top left it says, our mission, we help companies appreciate people 
who do great work. And we do that because we believe that celebrating great work inspires people to invent, to create, to discover. And when people are inspired, companies grow. So we, we believe that our business matters, right? And we have, our people believe that their business matters. I'm standing behind a Filipino gal named Feli Salazar. She retired about five years ago. So this was probably eight, nine years ago. I'm standing behind Feli, and she's working on our watch line and she's bouncing and she's kind of humming, uh, which is really putting me in a good mood as I was, I was watching her work. I love watching people work. Uh, they don't let me do any work, but I love to watch people work. And she finishes an award and she goes to take another one and I take the opportunity to say, Philly, how are you, how are you doing today? And she says, I'm great. And I said, I, I can see that. Tell me, why are you so great? And honestly, she said, because I just finished a 15 year award for, and she read me the guy's name, and when he gets this, it's going to make his day. And I'm asking myself, do I have to worry about Feli's quality? I don't, right? Do I have to worry why she came to work today? Do I have to worry whether she's going to engage with her teammates and drive improvements? I mean, she's got a purpose. She's part of something bigger than herself. And that's intrinsically rewarding and motivating. I don't spend time trying to gear people up, nor do I have to pull them into strategy deployment because they want to help drive things. And I think everyone's got to find a purpose and a reason uh, for why you do what you do. Uh, this statement at the bottom, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna read to you. Uh, it all starts with our people. We appreciate people. So appreciates our brand. So we gotta, of course, it's gotta be in the lead statement. We appreciate people who believe we're bigger together than we are apart, who work shoulder to shoulder, even when they don't see eye to eye, who have great ideas and genius solutions and a collaborative spirit, who understand what clients really need is a good listening to, who watch out, speak up, and work safely, who keep their promises, learn lessons, laugh, spread joy, create a sense of family, who do the right thing because it's the right thing to do, who realize that ultimately we're in the most important business of all, the business of valuing people. Now, it may be a little bit self-serving to say we're in the most important business of all, uh, but we like to talk that way. And, um, and our people buy it. Uh, when on the Great Places to Work survey, uh, the Institute tells us that we have the highest pride scores of anyone that they, they do, higher than healthcare, which is astonishing. Um, so we've, uh, uh, maybe you're thinking, well, they've sold their people a bill of goods, but I'm telling you, no, no, we do great things. So uh, I, I think your people want to feel like they're part of something that matters. So help them, help them find a connection to that. So, yes. How did you create that statement? So um, we've had this statement for uh, about eight years, ever since we started this new uh, format of the strategy map. Uh, it was the CEO and our uh, executive VP of marketing, who's my peer on the executive team, and me. There may have been another person in the room. But we, we began by talking about values. You know, what is it that we value? And, and each of these statements kind of started as a value, if you will. But it just kind of felt kind of antiseptic and, and uh, just kind of sterile, just kind of And so we started describing what we meant with each of the values and started coming up with these kinds of ideas. And then the marketing guy took it, and this is what he came back with. I was like, dude, <laughs> you rocked it. This is great. Yeah. I came back with some bolts and nuts, and he came back with this, this brilliant statement. All right, so, um, all right, so let's talk about then the development of the strategy map. Specifically, I'm talking about this, this teal uh, line in the middle, if you will. So a uh, high level, uh, every d August there's a, a, an offsite for all the vice presidents. Uh, we look at all the data, what's going on with the company, with the industry, um, with our competition and so forth. Uh, we figure out what our opportunities and our challenges are and from that we, we define these. And more specifically, um, it's three days, it's offsite. Uh, all the VPs come from around the world. Uh, so there's like 60 of us. Uh, in a room almost this big, we sit in a big U shape so that we're all facing each other and can see each other. And um, our spouses come, they don't come to the meetings, um, but they're doing stuff on their own. It's, a, it's, a, it's kind of a bonding time for us, especially for those who are out of the country. Um, 
Uh, first day uh, in the morning, uh, we just turn on the fire hose and we absorb data. Uh, the income statement, profitability, uh, competition, market share, costs, profitability, you know, at all, we just, we just absorb data. Um, so we understand that. Lots of conversation, discussions. And then that first afternoon, we break into uh, cross-functional groups. So in this last one, I was, I was there with someone from marketing, with our leader from human resources, which we call people and great work, with uh, uh, an IT, two IT vice presidents, our retail operation vice president, uh, she just wanted to be there. Um, who else was in there? Uh, but there are about eight of us, okay, cutting across the enterprise. And, and each group takes a strategic topic that the executive team selected before the offsite, and they just, they just kick it around and pull it apart and talk about it uh, for half a day, and then part of the time the next morning. Um, and then uh, we spend the whole second day um, in our U shape, and each of the groups get up and kind of say, well, this is, what, this is where we went with the discussion, and then we talk about it more with everybody. And uh, it's just a lot of talk, but it's interesting how over the course of the discussion, everybody gets on the same sheet of music, and we, we, we dismiss stuff that doesn't make sense to us, and we, we glom on to things that we're all saying, we gotta do that. And um, this is a very healthy meeting. The, um, uh, it's getting healthier and healthier. I would say in the last couple of years especially, it's gotten to the point where there's no individual thinking about function. There's no sales viewpoint. There's no, well, but we gotta do this. It's, everybody's got their corporate hat on. So you're not fighting any battles other than, than the battle of winning the business, right? Of, of doing good at the business. And um, we come out of, uh, this three days, and then we golf. Uh, we golf the next day, so put that on there. We go, we, we go and play uh, the next, the last day. Yes, sir. Peter, do you help facilitate these uh, two-day events? So the, the CEO uh, runs the meeting, if you will, and, um, but uh, he keeps handing it off to different people. So the CFO gets up, and the, the chief marketing officer gets up, and uh, various people get up. And then when, when, we're, when we're doing the, uh, the whole second day, when we're, we're having discussions, he's just sitting on the sidelines. He's just one of everybody. And the team that has spent the time talking about it is leading the discussion at that point. Does that make sense? Yeah, Dale? What's the process look like in generating the topics that you break up? Yeah, it's, a, uh, it's an interactive process between the executive team. There's 10 of us on the executive team, uh, all the people you'd expect, marketing, IT, human resources, finance, supply chain, looms large, of course, um, and uh, interaction with our board of directors. So uh, we'll usually present in the board meeting, uh, before the meeting, uh, here are some of the topics that we're thinking we need to be thinking through and understanding. They'll give us input and feedback. We put it in the report so they have time to think about it before the meeting. And then after, uh, I'm glad you asked this because I, I hadn't thought to, to bring this up. After the vice president offsite meeting, we've got all this data and we've got a better feel about what matters and what connects. Then we do a retreat with the board and it's at that retreat that we nail down the items that go on this strategy map. And the, uh, the, our founder's daughter, who are a private company, uh, Mr. Tanner started the company, his daughter is chair of the board, and she runs the board meeting where, where we uh, select these items. Uh, but she's not really selecting them, she's just pushing back on us and questioning. And usually her questions uh, are, uh, are we doing right by our people? That's usually what she's asking about. Yes, ma'am. Uh -huh. discussion we've gone from very functionally centric to more of what's right for the business. That's right. How did that evolve or how did you, uh, how did that move that forward? That's a great question because if I knew that I could write a book, right? <laughs> um, I, you know, I think uh, I would say that it was years and years of our CEO saying, put on your company hat. And, uh, and then reinforcing when people did. And, uh, and then that, 
and, and that just was that happened for a long time. And then in conjunction with that, of course, the organization just keeps getting healthier and healthier. So those two things combined, I would say, uh, we evolved uh, to that point. Uh, but I will say, I'll tell you, and, and you know, we're, we're not sitting by function. So, so as I mentioned, 50, 60 people in a U shape, and it's just, it's just all mixed up. And uh, I'll walk in, and I'll see three of my VPs here, here, and there, and I'll think, I'm going to sit here. You know, we just, everyone just spreads out, which is good, I think. It wasn't always that way. It just be support functions don't sit together like uh -uh. supply chain, right? Uh-uh, uh-uh. But I can see her over there, and I can see him over here. Yeah. So they just sit? We just sit wherever. Yeah. Day or? Yeah, each of the days. Or in the meeting. I'm sorry. In this meeting, no. In in the business, in the business, actually, uh, my executive team. I have I have ten directors and vice presidents, and we we have a row. Of, we have a desk set up that's about in this setup. We don't have offices. We sit out in an open configuration. So I've got one. I got I got my four VPs sitting on on all four sides of me. Uh, we're talking all the time. Uh, directors next to them, and our what used to be our offices are, are very well used conference rooms now. They weren't very well used when it was my office. I was never in there, but now people are in there all the time. Yeah. No, I'm talking about in the meeting. Yeah, thank you. I'm <laughs> you mean how are they disciplining me? Uh, yeah, thanks, God. Yes. Okay, so, so my vice presidents are in the middle of, of developing this strategy. They're in the middle of defining the focus. And so they, I don't have to get them bought in to the resources that need to be applied or the things that we need to not do next year. They're, they've been right there in the middle of it. And they understand why we're doing this and why it matters. My directors have not. So I'm going to describe... Okay, so I'm going to refer now to how we get the directors on board. Very good. If we're ready to move on. Everybody good with that? Okay, we're good. All right, so, so now uh, we come back from this meeting. Uh, that strategy map isn't actually going to be launched until December, but, uh, but I don't wait till December to be in cascading the new strategy to my teammates. We do that in September. Uh, we do it every six months. We used to do it every 12 months. But after several years, we found that everyone was finishing uh, their projects about 10 or nine months into it, and they wanted to start something new. And my worry about starting something new is we're gonna get a new strategy in a couple of months. I don't want you chasing up the wrong tree. So we just decided instead to, to, to go every six months, and, and that's about right for us now. A couple of years ago, somebody suggested we go every three months, and it was just horrifying to me, because September and March, our, our busiest months as we're uh, doing strategy deployment. We don't, we don't do anything else in September and March other than strategy deployment. Um, and let me just walk you through at a high level. Um, we do it twice a year. Uh, we definitely make time to celebrate and recognize. Uh, we review where we fit in the company, how we can help others. Uh, we share insights and information. And then teams define and set their strategic Goals. And I'm going to just walk you through how, how that happens. So week one, this is week one in September. Uh, week one in March is all celebration, party time. It's celebrating the, the last six months, basically. And on, uh, on Tuesday and Wednesday, uh, we have a theater um, that's about as big as this room, a smaller area up front about like this, but then the seats kind of go up. It's, it's, it's steep and it's fantastic. The acoustics are great. And um, uh, we meet in the theater in the afternoons on Tuesday and Wednesday afternoons so that the two shifts can come together. And then our sh third shift, uh, we have a smaller third shift. We have some operations we need to just be running all the time. And they'll come in to the afternoon meeting. Um, it's always good to have them there. Um, in, that, in that meeting, everyone's just presenting. Every team is getting up in front. Not the team, but the team leaders are getting up in front and presenting everybody. This is what we did in the last six months. Lots of cheering, lots of celebration. Um, 
they present their lead and lag outcomes, they talk about their cost savings, the number of improvements they've done in the last six months, and their safety results. And uh, here's a picture of one of these happening. Um, this, is, this, is a, this is a two shift presentation here. Uh, team leaders and uh, group leaders and the engineer, the tall guy's uh, an engineer who, who works with, with this team um, on the mechanical, the mechanics that they have in their teams. So, uh, you know, they don't, they don't look, they don't look all as happy as I was hoping the picture would look, but this, the, there, there's a lot of, there's a lot of positive energy uh, in this. You just have to take my word for that. Yes. Um, we, we began by having the group leaders do it. So and for us, group leaders are supervisor manager level, so they're, they're exempt employees. And then we, and then a couple of years into it, we started having the team leaders come and watch. And then a couple of years into it, we had some brave team leaders got up and wanted to present. And then it just be kind of, over time it became the standard. And the standard now is the group leader gets up, but the team leaders do all the talking. That's our, that's the standard now. It just evolved over time. Uh, I think with, with, with all of our systems, um, there, is very, there is very little that we said, everybody start doing this. Uh, almost every time we said, you know, this is what we want to kind of do. Who's interested? And, and, you know, you got your early adopters who would say, well, we want to try that. And, and, maybe, and maybe you'd have a core group kind of right here who want to do that. And then someone way out there were like, well, maybe you, maybe you wait, because we can kind of manage this here. We figure, make a lot of mistakes. We figure it out. And they're learning. And they're changing. And then we start adding people. And before long, um, if you want to be cool, you got to get in, right? You don't want to wait too long. Um, and that's kind of the way everything happens. It just kind of evolves for us. It evolves. We found that easier to manage change. Uh, by, by getting volunteers and early adopters in first. And then we just kind of grow. And if it's going to die, which sometimes happens, right? Sometimes you, you think of something's a good idea, people want to try it, and then it's not a good idea. You want it to die with that small group who learned something, had fun, not with the whole enterprise, realizing, well, that was dumb. So that answers your question. Very yes. Question. Yeah. Oh, uh, all of them. So, so all of the, all of the team leaders and all the group leaders, all the engineers, all of my exempt employees. So all the buyers, all the, all the uh, systems people, um, product development people, we're, we're all attending. And then uh, a smattering of people from um, my peers on the executive team uh, will show up for an hour at a time. The CFO comes in, the CEO comes in, the CEO comes in, the, the human resource person comes in. They, they come in and listen, and, um, and they'll be there for an hour or two, and, and then they'll, they'll pop up and say, thanks, everybody, got to run, you know, and they'll, they'll, they'll vacate. So. so, all right. So I want to show you a couple of the target, a couple of target conditions um, that um, our team members write uh, for themselves. Now this is a little bit out of sequence because uh, I'm going to show you how they come up with these in the third and fourth week, um, but we're celebrating them in the first week, and I've got the, the celebration data from September for the last six months on these slides. So if you don't mind me, I'm going to be a little bit confusing for a moment as I show you the results and the target statements. We're going to come back to writing target statements in, in just a second. So, so here's an example of a target condition. Um, a team who's doing emblem efficiency says, we're going to decrease labor costs per piece from 40 cents to 33 cents, an 18% improvement by August 31st, 2017. All of our statements look just like that. Key metric from this to that by this date. Uh, and then the question is, so that's the lag, right? The cost per piece is the outcome that they're chasing. The lead, the lead metric is the lever that every team member is going to pull every day to get to that lag metric. And in their case, they're saying, we're going to implement five process improvements. Um, and for them, the way they do process improvements, they figured that would be enough 
for them if they did that over a five month period. I say five months because you got one month of planning and then you run for five months. They're basically saying every month we'll do a major process improvement and the net effect is cost will decrease 18%. So for their lag metric then, this is what they presented in September. Uh, they said they were gonna do five. They actually did seven process improvements and there were four that were still in progress. They did one every month, April, May, June, and then I don't know if they started to worry we're not gonna make it and they did two in July and two in August, but uh, so this is where they said, let's do more than one, let's do two, and, and just like that, the cost dropped down to where they wanted it to be. So you can say they actually got about a 20% reduction in cost in five months. Pretty impressive. Here's another one, a quality goal. We're gonna improve our first time quality and decrease our uh, quality issues from an average of 45 per month to an average of 35 per month, a 22% improvement by August 31st, 2017. Uh, the lag is reduced QIs. The lead is weekly process and product audits, one each per team member with teaching moments. So every team member every week will do process and product audits. And from those, they'll find some stuff that uh, will provide a teaching moment for the entire team. That's the lead metric that this team selected. Yes? Uh, I'm gonna talk about that in week three and four. I'll come back. Week three and four of this seminar. So I hope you brought a lunch. <laughs> I'll get to week three and four in a sec. All right, um, so, um, they, they ended up with eight teaching moments over the course of the five months. Uh, they conducted 28 audits in March, which is uh, astonishing because that's the month they decided to start doing it. 56 in April, 70 in May. Uh, they ramped up again here in August, and uh, sure enough, uh, they decreased it. What was the goal, like 20, 30 percent or something like that? They, they reduced the, the quality just like they said they would. Um, part of the celebration, every team uh, gives us a summary of the last six months. They did safe 51 safety catches, everyone did one. Uh, they had 73 suggested improvements in the team, 35 of which they completed, 11 are in process, so 46. So there's, if my math is right, there's like 27 that the team decided not to implement. Or maybe they're still waiting to be uh, evaluated. The teams, the teams share their ideas with each other and then they decide which ones to do and then they do it, is, is the, way, the way we do quality improvements. And everybody participated in turning in ideas and the team saved $157,000 over the course of the, of the six months. So, um, I've got more of these, um, but I don't, I don't think we, have time. No, let's, let's uh... so, so this is that tooling team that makes the dies and the trims for the, those emblems, the, our legacy product. And um, uh, most of those emblem teams are all in one big room, uh, if you will, uh, a wing of, of the building. And the tooling people sit right in the middle of them. Right? They used to be in a machine shop, and uh, they didn't want to move either, but, um, but now they're right by their, their customer. And uh, what they have done for two periods now is um, they do Gemba walks as their lead metric. Every one of these team members in the tooling team is expected to walk through their customers' teams uh, every day and talk to people. And inevitably what happens is people show them problems with the tools. This isn't working like I thought it would. This isn't right. And these guys are bright. They say, well, I know how to fix that. And they go back and they fix it. And they keep track of how many of these improvements they make. That's their strategy deployment. And it makes astonishing things happen. Once they started doing this, as we go visit these emblem teams, they talk nonstop about how awesome and helpful the, the tooling teams are. So. And that's, that's this whole outward mindset that we seek uh, with our people. Um, here's a 15% reduction in cost per piece. Uh, and it's interesting, they, uh, 
they were going to do so many process improvements. They realized right here, we're not going to make it. So they did 22, and, and then they just popped under. They, they made it here. Uh, so that was what? That was a 15% improvement in five months. And uh, this is that team in the celebration. Uh, they, uh, they, they saved $195,000. And 29 cents. They always crack me up. We were visiting them yesterday, and, and they had a pennies to the pennies on there. And they, they, they know it makes me laugh. So that when they said it, they all started to laugh. Uh, I told Bahar I was showing this picture uh, of her. She's on this ream of paper. And uh, she said, Can you cut it off right here? Can you cut it off at the knees? I said, no, I can't. <laughs> can't. Can't do that. So. Um, Here's another example. They wanted to take their pieces per hour from 7.1 to 9.3, a 31% increase by August 31st. I wonder what are you thinking about the size of these goals? Pretty amazing, right? Uh, I'm not setting these goals. The team is setting the goals. Now, I'll tell you about, um, about three years ago, uh, the teams were, all the goals were like 7, 6, 8% for the five month period, which uh, I'm thinking that's fantastic. And I, I said in one of these meetings, I was thinking seven, eight percent, six months, that's double digits over the year. And I said, you know, you guys are doing fantastic, double digit improvement. I mean, that's kind of the lean standard. Uh, I'm really proud of you. And evidently, I was misunderstood. Um, they thought I meant double digit every six months. And within about a year, all the goals went up to 15, 16, 18. And then when some teams set a 25% goal, others aren't gonna be outdone, so they set a 30% goal. And uh, the astonishing thing is they hit it. So, you know, be careful what you ask for. Or maybe I should be asking for, you know, triple digit, goal. well, that's, you don't do 100%, right? Yeah. Oh, death, if you know that. Yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. They focus on, but we don't focus on the, and I'll get right to you, we don't focus on the lag at all over the course of the six months. Just like we don't focus on budgets, uh, we don't focus on on-time delivery, uh, we, we, we tend to our knitting. You know, we do all the right things. Uh, you know, like budget is a great example. Some months you're under budget, some months you're over budget, but it kind of moves like this. And it's ridiculous to go into celebration mode because you were under budget and then, then kick yourself because you're over budget. The reality is, wait till the end of the period, do the right stuff, it'll take care of itself. That's kind of our mindset. And so what we focus on is, is doing their lead metric, doing their lead metric. Now, if they've been pulling the lead metric for two months and nothing's moving, we might say, you have the right lead metric or are you pulling the lever hard enough? That's maybe the two questions we would ask you. And we maybe have one team every six months that changes their lead metric midstream. It says, okay, we're gonna abandon that. We're gonna go to something that we already tried that we know works. But I love the fact that they experiment and they try different things. So, yes. Yeah, so, so data meaning like cost and quality and, and things like time, yes. So um, uh, time is tracked by that lid system that we created. It's got the cup or the tray, it's got the RFID chip as it moves through the process that the clock is ticking from the time I launch it until it ships. Um, um, the, the team, uh, we move people around every day. So uh, everything's custom, as I said, so the work, I'm sorry, I'm giving you a workout moving around, aren't I? You doing all right? Okay, all right. I didn't even think about that. Is that wasteful? Should I trim the waist? I mean, no, okay, he's, he's giving me the okay. So um, uh, we move people around because uh, the team comes in in the morning, they look at their planner, they see what hit their planner overnight, and they realize, oh, I don't need two setters today. I don't need one of my polishers today. I, I need more people who can do enamel today, whatever it is. And the team agrees what it is, and then they, they all come together. The team leaders meet right after the team huddles, and they, they swap people. And we don't just move around the value stream. We move across the enterprise. Because on Mondays and Tuesdays, the distribution value stream is swamped, always is. Um, and then at different times of the year, different value streams get busy for various reasons. And then day to day, it, we're just we're probably moving two dozen people every day, 
between across the enterprise. And um, so the team every day knows what their, what their hourly wages are today. And they lo that is the one piece that somebody actually had to manually put into the system, the dollars we spend today. Uh, the supplies, as the Skeeter brings them to the team, they scan it and the cost goes right into their costs for the day. Um, uh, so, so all that, everything else happens. We've created systems that capture all that information. And I've got, I've got four IT people who, uh, I say IT, uh, they're, they're our systems guys and gals, and they work, they just work for us. And, and we've got them one in each value stream. Uh, and the engineers are busted up in the value streams and the, and the product development and the buyers. Everyone's in value streams from procurement to the logistics and the shipping. So when I've got a VP of distribution, Paul has all the costs and all the responsibilities that he needs to ship that product. He knows exactly what his cost per piece is. There's no allocating. There's no figuring out where the money goes. It's all, it's all there. Accounting loves us, absolutely loves us, because we know our cost per piece throughout the day, every day, as, as it happens. And it's not by, we're not keeping track of a ton of transactions either. We're just, we just know what it is, because we've got the basic elements. Uh, I, I worry I'm burning my time, but, I, but I'll tell you something else uh, that just comes to my mind. So every team has, um, uh, some metrics that they follow, quality, cost, and delivery, time. Uh, and they each set goals for those three, and then they have a chart that our systems people have created. And every day, um, they have their chart, and it shows how they did yesterday versus their goal. And if they hit their goal, the day is green, and then the metric. If they miss the goal, the bar is red, and the metric. And then they have the six-month target and the monthly target, which they're trying to turn green, trying to hit their goal. When all three of those charts turn green, and the team uh, does some other things, like they've got some appreciation goals and some safety goals, and everybody participating in idea goals and stuff like that, so a lot of peer pressure. Uh, you know, you still need a safety uh, catch this month, don't you? Look at that, <laughs> turn that one in. So um, when they meet those goals, then we take them out to lunch and we celebrate, and, and I go out to lunch a lot, which is uh, fun. And because it's, it's, it's rowdy and it's fun, and, and the teams talk about their success and what they did, and then they come back and they set all new goals and all the charts turn red again. And they just start all over. And so that's just nonstop, always going. But all that data is inherent in the system. We've created the system to just capture that. Long answer to your question. Okay. So here's a 31% improvement goal. And look what their lead metric was. They were going to reduce and or eliminate 190 wastes in the team, 10 per person, by August 31st, 27. This is actually uh, two different teams, Empire and, and, and Angels, and, and actually the, a new product. That's why there's 19 people. So we typically have about five, five on a team. And... Um, so they, I saw this chart sitting on their team board, Waste Warriors. <laughs> I thought that was so cool. I had to take a picture of that. Uh, so they got everybody's name, everybody's name on the bottom here from the three different teams. And uh, uh, visually, look, they've, they've broken them up into a day and night shift and then a different team here. And then these are some new people that came on during the course of the process. And, and they had their goal they wanted to hit in terms of everybody doing waste. And uh, people, a lot of people just blew it away, obviously. But then I also thought that was very clever. They wrote the type of waste in the square that each person did, and then they kept uh, a track of the waste down here on the bottom. What a, what a, this is fantastic. I love, I love seeing stuff like this. And, and so when we see something like this that we like, uh, we, have, we would do a monthly leadership meeting where all the team leaders and the group leaders come together, and uh, we'll have, this team get up and tell everybody what they did and people are looking at it and and then like within the month you see like six more pop up somewhere if it's a brilliant idea it'll explode and everybody will start using it uh, if it's not it'll go away no one will start using it and I'm happy either way you know whatever whatever the teams want to do they call the shots I just expose them to stuff show them possibilities that other people create so I don't actually have to come up with anything 
right? I don't have to be creative or, or smart or anything. It's a great job. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so they hit their goal. I'm sorry. Um, they wanted to get up over this line. They actually hit it in April and May, and then they slagged uh, before the, uh, for the period. They had their 30% uh, improvement in efficiency. Okay. Um, now i got to move on. Uh, well, let me just show you this one real quick. Um, <laughs> uh, so, so here this team is saying that they're going to increase their efficiency 20% from 2.96 pieces per hour to 3.55 pieces per hour by reducing process time by 75 seconds, which is 15 seconds per piece per month. And so what they basically focused on each month was, this month we gotta cut 15 seconds out of this process. They just spend their month saving two seconds here three seconds there. At the end of the month, 15 seconds are gone. So we're, we're visiting this team during this process, and our chief engineer is brilliant. Uh, it's brilliant. Uh, he's my director of engineering, and he's sitting there watching these guys talk about the improvements they've made to their process. In some cases, they've gotten help from his, from his uh, engineers, but in most cases, they've just fixed processes and made them better. And, and as we're walking away, he says, that is so incredible. My engineers spend no time thinking about that. And they, they never will. The team's just in there doing it. And um, anyway, I, thought that was, I thought that was pretty cool. Um, okay, we gotta, we gotta move on. Okay, so uh, we celebrate with the leaders on Tuesday and Wednesday. And then on Thursday and Friday, my executive staff and I, we go visit every team uh, we spend 15 minutes with every team. It's just celebration. We start at 5.30 in the morning, uh, breakfast with our third shift, and our CEO comes to that, and our people and great work leader comes to that. And then we just go through all of our teams 15 minutes at a time over the course of, of two days. And uh, it's just a lot of celebrations. We, we share with them a list of all the great things that have happened from various teams in the last six months. And then they tell us all the same stuff we heard in the theater but it's them telling us now. And then they walk us around their cell and they show us stuff. Come here, look at this. You gotta see what we did here. You gotta see what we did there. Um, a lot of celebration. At the end of the, uh, at the, end of the 15 minutes, uh, we congratulate them. Great six months, everybody. What happens on Monday? And everybody shouts, we start all over again. <laughs> I love that. I love that. I'm hoarse by the end of, the, uh, of those, but the people are excited. Okay, so. Uh, week two, uh, we start our scan, uh, we start our plan, and uh, on Tuesday of that week, so in answer to the question, how do I get the directors on board, uh, all the global directors fly in, and we spend the whole day Tuesday, the vice presidents and now all the directors are there, and, and we, just, we just do a fire hose of data. We just, we have people come in from marketing and sales and, and accounting and IT and everyone's just coming in and sharing data. We're just talking and, and we're hearing about the issues in, in, in Asia, we're hearing about the issues in Australia and in India and we're learning from each other. It's astonishing, uh, you know, we see each other throughout the, the six months, but we only have serious talks like this every six months and it's amazing to me how in six months, there becomes so much, because they're so far away, we, we, we get out of touch with each other. And this day is fantastic for everybody kind of coming back in. And I hear, I hear what Singapore is saying, and everybody's like, oh, I didn't understand, that's why you were doing that. And it's just a fantastic time to get on the same sheet again. By the end of the day, we've talked about the offside and where we are, everyone's, everyone's nodding like this. We're there, we got it. That's what we're talking about. Yes, Scott. Oh, no, yeah, so, so um, Robert O'Deever, who is the head of operations in London, I was with him last week at the European Shingo Conference in Brussels, and we were sharing notes and saying, what are we going to do, what are you going to do next, and uh, just like uh, all of my vice presidents who run different value streams, globally, everyone goes back after this week and does what I'm talking about in weeks three and four. Great question. 
great, great clarification. All right, so um, uh, that's what happens on Tuesday. It's the executive review. And then Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, we take all the exempt employees. So the team leaders aren't part of this. It's the, it's the group leaders um, and, the, and the engineers and the buyers and logistics and so forth. We all go off sides for three days. And uh, so there's, what, 70 of us, 60 of us or so. And, um, and it includes the exempt employees from India, Singapore, Australia, uh, Toronto, London. They're all there too. And um, they all fly in. And, uh, and it's awesome because so while I'm meeting with the directors and vice presidents on Tuesday, the, the managers from international are spending Monday and Tuesday, uh, their days are full. I mean, they're off doing this and doing that and, and whatever. It's, it's fantastic for us. Um, excellent use of resource in my mind. Um, so uh, we go off site and we're joined by another 15 or so from throughout the company. A couple people from client services come, a couple people from accounting come, IT, they come and sit with us for uh, at least two of the three days. And uh, on the first day, it's just data. We're just, we turn on the fire hose again and we just absorb data all day long. And, 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 I, and I, I, some people might characterize it as a beating, but I gotta tell you, 445, I'm looking around the theater and everyone's sitting on the edge of their seats. You know, like, come on, give me more, give me more. So uh, I love it. I love the energy and the enthusiasm. Uh, but I think the reason why they're so engaged in it is next week, the week after this, they got to go share with their teams. They're not just listening, they're going to engage with this data and they've got to answer questions with their teams. They've got to interact with their teams. So, so they don't want to not be in the know about anything. Right? They want to know whatever they can so they can help their teams understand whatever they want to know. I can, I can tell you. I can, I can help you. Uh, if I don't know, I can go find out. So uh, uh, reports from different departments. Uh, we also do some leadership development. Um, on, the, uh, on the second day, we spent about a half day talking about a leadership topic. And uh, I, this, this last September, uh, I wanted to spend some time... Um, um, I, wanted, I wanted people, I wanted our leaders to think more about their weaknesses and to be more vulnerable and open to, you know, what can they do to, uh, to get better and to improve. And so um, I made myself very vulnerable and I said to everybody, you know, I'm... Uh, I'm, I have very high expectations. I'm highly driven. Um, I'm, uh, and so I, I'm, I'm easily frustrated, right? If, if, if stuff isn't going great, I, I, I get frustrated. And um, my team, um, I, I believe, I said this, and my team was kind of shaking their heads, but I don't believe, I, I believe that my team works hard not to frustrate me. <laughs> you know, I think they, you know, they, they, they want to satisfy me. And, uh, and I don't think, I'm, I'm not a tyrant, I'm just, I'm just highly driven. And, uh, listen to me, excuse myself. Um, I, uh, I feel like sometimes I behave in, in a way that, that, that I have to apologize for afterwards. I'm, I'm, I, I drive a little bit too hard sometimes. And, um, and I said to, to, to all of our exempt employees, um, I worry if you've ever seen me like that and you think that's good leadership. And, and it, it would just be devastating to me if you got frustrated with your team members and said to yourself, wow, that's what Gary does. So that's good leadership. This is what I should do. And, um, and I led with that, which then it was, it was awesome. By, by putting myself totally out there with no excuse as being a leader fraught with error, uh, we had an hour discussion where everybody just candidly was, was, was saying, I wish I did this better, and I wish I did that better, and I'm not very good at that. And they had table discussions. And, and I just think um, um, I mean, there was a time in my career when I think I would have been afraid to be that vulnerable. Uh, but I think as a leader, if you want your people to grow and develop, you've got to, you've got to, you gotta show, I think you gotta show that it's okay. It's okay to admit to weaknesses and shortcomings and, 
and failures and so forth. Um, so anyway, we, we do something pretty significant in terms of leadership mind shift as part of this. I mean, I got the whole world there, right? So, so let's all move somewhere together. And, and we, don't, we don't squander that opportunity. God, I feel like I kind of threw a cold blanket on the uh, <laughs> everything. So, uh, so bear with me there. Um, and, and then on, the, on the, the last half day before we, we go play some games, um, we, we break into value streams and each group leader is figuring out, man, I got all this stuff. What am I going to go back and share with my team? Not what am I going to go tell them, but what do I share with them so that they can figure out how to connect to strategy? And we review that at the end of the meeting. So that's what happens on the second week. Any questions about the second week? The offside? Oh, yes, Scott. Yeah. So we share with them, we, 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 thank you for reminding me of that, Scott. We, we actually have all the vice presidents get up in front of this group and we discuss the whole VP meeting. Everything we talked about, what was said, what was decided, how we do it, in addition to having people just come in and share information. So when the, when the product development guy from IT comes in and talks to them for half an hour, they've got a framework because we've already told them what happened offsite. Now, they, now they're getting some color to the discussion. Other questions about week two? Okay, so week three and four is our dream and scheme. Uh, uh, scheme doesn't sound, uh, all of a sudden it, it sounds a little uh, uh, scheming, <laughs> if you will, but uh, it's our teams figuring out, hey, what's possible? What are we gonna do? So the, the group leaders come back and they, sp they immediately, like on, on Monday, they'll meet with their support team and they'll just say everything that happened. And some of the support team members are there. The engineers uh, are there and so forth. Um, and, um, and they all agree what the message is. And then on Tuesday, by Tuesday or Wednesday that week, uh, the whole team's uh, production kind of shuts down, hit and miss around the facility. It's, it's not unusual at all during this third and fourth week for me to walk around and see a team just vacant for an hour at a time. And uh, they're just talking and the group leaders telling them information and asking questions. And I love, I love to just stand outside the room where the, the team members can't see me. I love to just watch them from the back and see the interaction, see the questions and see what's going on. I, I never go into them and I don't know, just, it just doesn't feel, I, I worry that if I go in that I become the meeting. And so I've never been to one of those discussions. I just, but I watch. I have nothing to do in weeks three and four. Um, so uh, I go around, I watch a lot of, you know, I sneak behind and watch things. I can't hear what's being said either, um, but I can see faces. You know, I can see energy and, and where people are. So uh, over the course of those two weeks, they figure out their, their direction and they start to write these target statements to your question. Was it Rick? Is that? Uh, they start to write these target statements then, and they, um, uh, they all know how to write it, and uh, they, they're figuring out, okay, the first thing they start with is what, is what is the lag metric? What's the key thing that we need to do, and why would we choose that? Because when they come back and present it, the other thing they have to say is, how does it connect to strategy? Why did we choose this metric? How does it connect to strategy? So those are the two things they come up with first, and then they choose the magnitude of the improvement. It's usually based on gaps, where they are and, and what they need to do. Um, let's say, for example, that they realized when they were looking at the profitability data that their product has a slightly lower gross margin than most of the other products. Well, no one wants to be in that position, right? And so they, they do the math with their team, and they go, well, how much cost will we have to cut to be better than those two? I mean, that, I think that's what they say. I don't know, I never, I'm never in there. But I know when they present it, I do the math, I see that's what they did. They, they took themselves from a position of possible vulnerability to a position of strength. They know what they're doing and why they're doing it and the size of the, the, the change that they need. But it's tough when, when you choose a 30% improvement to put you in the right place and all the others choose a 20% and you're like, ah, got it, 
we're still lagging them. <laughs> so that always makes me laugh. So um, the um, and then and then they, they probably take about a week to choose their lead metric. How do we make it happen? Uh, what are we going to do with that? And we've had enough time, enough experience with it, that we've seen just about every lead metric being applied. We've seen levers being pulled like crazy, and, and, and they, maybe not in their team, but they've seen it done in other teams that are nothing like their team, but they've seen what it did there. And they'll maybe go talk to that team and see what they learned. Uh, I see a lot of the same lead metrics uh, showing up, and I see teams experimenting with new lead metrics, something they saw somebody else do. They kind of keep it fresh. Let's try something different this six months. And I see them learning from, from doing it. Um, and sometimes, sometimes it's interesting. One team had to pull this lever like this, and this other team sets the goal to pull like that, and they realize that actually just this much pressure and the results are piling up. Every team's different. Uh, or they think it's going to be simple, and they've got to really start pulling hard on the lever. Uh, but the team learns as they go. So did I answer your question? Any other questions on weeks three and four? Yes, sir. Um, so um, half of them, half of them grew up in the system. So half of them have experienced as a as a team member, as a team leader. Uh, so uh, they know what they're doing. They know how to do it. They've seen it done. Uh, the other half uh, maybe came from client services to become one of our group leaders, or maybe an engineer became a group leader or something, or, or maybe we hired somebody from the outside. And, um, and uh, they're, they're getting one-on-one -on -one coaching from their vice president or, or director, and it's trial and error. So the first time they're going in there, they're just trying to figure it out. Uh, the, the time where uh, there's a lot of learning that takes place is actually in, uh, in week five, this Monday meeting, uh, all throughout the day, each value stream has two hours, and they each come in with, with all the group leaders and all the team leaders, and we listen, and the whole value stream listens to everybody's target statements and to everybody's lead metric and everybody's connection with strategy, and they, and they all push against each other, and they challenge each other. And inevitably, there are about four well, there were two in September who hadn't done this before. There was a new buyer who had never done this before. And uh, who was the other one? I can't remember who the other one was, but they'd never done it before. And so they came in with, with kind of, despite the help that they got, their statements weren't quite right, and they weren't, uh, one of them wasn't aggressive enough. And they could tell because they shared it, and the room just kind of went silent. And they were like, what? <laughs> And Eric says, well, you can kind of do that in your sleep, you know, and then they, they talk it through. And, and they had to go, so there were like two that had to go back to their team after this Monday meeting, say, hey, this doesn't quite work. In one of the cases, this new buyer uh, who did that, uh, she reported that when she went back to her teammates, they, they started laughing. They said, yeah, we knew that's what was going to happen. Uh, Why didn't you tell me? Well, you got experience. You know, you got to figure it out. Uh, so um, I will tell you that, you know, a decade ago, a decade ago, these meetings were hard because the statements weren't written right and the leads weren't connected and there was no obvious connection to strategy. It was just your pet project that you wanted to do or you identified six things you were going to do and we, we demand one. You can do other projects, right? But there's one that's a strategy deployment project. That's what we have found works for us. And um, at first, those first couple of years were tough. And then it just kind of got better and solidified. And now it's, it's just, it's a breeze. Uh, uh, almost all the ones that come, they're more ambitious than I would expect. They're written well, they got good plans, they're excited about it. Uh, but we have grown into that. We have gone, we have gone from clumsy, toddler falling around to, to maybe not Olympic athletes, but you know, high school, <laughs> maybe not high school, junior high athletes. So, yes, sir. How do you help teams develop the lead measure? I mean, is there a 
reset it to the next month, correct? Yeah, so uh, you know, they're moving around throughout the, the, the six month period and they're seeing other teams lead metrics. So they've, they've, the team members have seen every type of lead metric possible. And when they're in a team for the day, they're helping that team pull their lever. So they haven't just seen it, they've experienced uh, uh, other, other lead metrics. So uh, team members get it, our team members get it. And um, I'll bet 80% of them get it. And, um, and the rest are going along for the ride. Uh, but they're not unwilling participants. I'm just saying they may not be, they may not be able to sit down themselves and write a TARC condition. No, I bet they all could write a TARC condition. Uh, but a good TARC condition with a good lead metric, that's not everybody who can do that, right? But the team can do it. The team can do it well working together. So, yes? Can you clarify which team? Is that the Yeah. No, no, it's the work team. So a value stream might have 12 different production teams across three different shifts, and the team might have anywhere from four people to 12 people. And they are the people who work side by side every day, who attend their morning huddle together, who do their team meeting together, and then a, uh, they each have a team leader, and then a group leader has two or three of those. Uh -huh. Yeah, we have three chefs. So it depends. Some, some uh, multi-shift teams uh, work together and choose a common goal for all three of the teams that are across the shift, but most of them don't. Most of them have unique goals. One has a cost, they have separate metrics. So the day shift knows their cost per piece and their quality, and the second shift knows their cost per piece and their quality, the third shift knows theirs, and they may have different needs, right? Cost may be higher on the second shift, we gotta fix that. Quality may be worse on the third shift, we gotta fix that, and they focus on the right thing. And they all know what the other one's doing. They're trying to help each other too, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Following standard processes, I mean, that's, uh, um, that's hard. Um, and, 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 and uh, you know, the discipline, um, uh, you know, maybe, maybe I'll give ourselves a pass because every piece is different. And so the, uh, uh, the process time actually shifts from piece to piece from a single station. And, and we can't really see abnormality from uh, that shift, some of it gets buried, and so team members tend to to move to help each other because of the way the timing happens. And I was on a I was on a bus with some Toyota people in in Japan, and I I mentioned that that's the way we work because every piece is different, and they were horrified, and they just gave me a look like you're the devil, what kind of thing, you know? And I was like, I hear ya. I don't, I haven't, you know, we've been down this for almost three decades and I haven't figured out how to figure that out. My team members all know that that's a problem and we do have standard work, uh, but, but the process time varies from piece to piece and so it's just, it's just a struggle and I, Yeah. That's right. So, for example, um, let's go. Let's go to the simplest product, the emblem, which I showed you early on. A die is cut with a corporate logo in it. It shows different detail and so forth, and it's plated in different ways depending on what the look is that they want. It has different sorts of stones in it. Uh, that piece might take 30 seconds to polish. It might take 60 seconds to polish, depending on the detail and what's in the piece. And, um, or it may get color in a different way, or it may need to be, it may need to go through two plating processes. And so the team knows all that, and that's what the team is trying to hey Junka around. But I'm just telling you, they, they rotate to help each other, and so that particular abnormality is lost. I can't see that. It drives me crazy. Um, but that's a problem that we have. That's a very significant problem that we have. So when you say it's lost, it's lost. Can't see it. No. 
so, so yeah, so their costs per unit shift from day to day. And so nobody in our teams worries too much about the day-to-day -day shifts. They worry more about the long-term trends, if you will. And what's lost is, you know, you want to be able to walk into a team and immediately see abnormal from normal. And I can do that on just about everything except uh, the, the work labor, the adherence to tack time. That's my biggest vulnerability is I, I can't make a tack time work. Uh, can you? Well, the Toyota people couldn't relate. They. Well, yeah, I, I, you know, four different. They got four different types of vehicles following, and then in those vehicles, some are manual, some are automatic, and some are four doors, some are two doors, and uh, I mean, it's all mixed up, but. And I, and I would be insane to say that my process is more complex than making a car, but uh, uh, I was just embarrassed when they all looked at me like that. <laughs> yes, that's what I kept saying my, as, I, as I laid in bed that night. They don't understand my problems. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, everything is custom. Uh, uh, I think they would say theirs is too, but, I, but you know, I was in their home plant where they build custom homes and everyone is different and, and, uh, and the way it pulled off and spurs and came back together, I, 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 I was just blown away by it and, I, and it kind of reminded me of my plant, only we don't work that way. And I said to the guy who was doing the scheduling, how did you do this? Because it just was, looked impossible to me. And he said, 65 years. We've been working on it for 65 years. So I came back, and that's what I told my people. We are not going to give up on figuring out the tack time issue. It's just going to take us 65 years. <laughs> it's going to take us another 40 years. Uh, well, we're not making enough progress on it, though. So I'm sorry, there was another hand. And, yeah, yeah. yeah. So can you describe value streams and work teams within the value stream? Are there improvement processes that are deployed to fall outside of the value stream yeah. for functions that so we do track we do track abnormalities through the teams uh, on the production board and we are watching for consistent abnormalities that happen across teams and there is a support team that's made up of the group leaders uh, the fulfillment leader which is a director level uh, the engineers and so forth and they are trying to solve issues that affect multiple teams yeah and that that is happening and then there are also huge issues that nobody knows what to do about and we have a blitz leader who's also a team leader but once a month he's running a blitz cross-functional blitz and we're trying to solve the big issues so we are we are doing stuff outside of what's happening would on the team be connected to your ocean in terms of no they're not they're not connected to the ocean Yeah, um, no, HR, I, I would, um, so if all my peers were standing here, I would say, we all come back from the, the VP retreat and we all cascade strategy just like I'm describing, and, uh, but, but they're not as good at it. Not as good at it. Don't tell them I said that. But they're trying to get better at it, and, uh, and they know it. Um, and, uh, and our CEO constantly says, y'all aren't as good at it yet as supply chain. And nobody, it's, nobody takes offense and nobody's like, oh, get, get them. It, they're just like, yeah, we got to get better. And they, they ask for help. That's one of the reasons so many of them come to our offsite. Uh, they come to learn. And they'll, they'll ask, can we send these two people to your offsite? Yeah, bring them on. Let them come. Love to have them. So, all right, we better move on. Um, oh, I'm having fun though. I hope you're having fun. I'm having, I'm having a good time. Okay, so, um, so on Monday we review all those, and then uh, on, on Tuesday of that week, so we're actually now in the first week of October, uh, first week of April. On Tuesday we all go back to the theater for one afternoon, all three shifts. When I say we all, I mean the same people who are in that first celebration meeting, the group leaders, the team leaders, all the exempt employees. And one after the other, 
uh, everyone's got three minutes, that's all they got, and they get up in front of everybody and they say, uh, here's my target condition, here's how it connects to strategy, uh, here's our lead metric, we'll see you in five months. And they just one after another, they do that. And uh, it's fantastic. Me, in, in, in the celebration meeting and in these meetings, I'm a, I'm, I'm, I have a hard time, I have a hard time focusing. Right? I'm, I'm all over the place and I'm easily distracted, uh, which is probably good I don't have any outside windows right, around my office. Uh, that's, th th those are some of my weaknesses that I, I struggle to contain. And when I'm sitting in these meetings, uh, I do not pull my phone out. I don't, I don't even have a pad of paper in front of me. I got nothing. I just sit and, and pay full attention to them. I look at them, and I nod and I smile. They're only up there for three minutes and, and they are fully expecting that me and my vice presidents and my directors and everybody else in the room, that, that this is your time and we give them that time. It is, it is fully their time. And um, we let them know. I mean, we're saying in our manner, what you're saying matters. What you're doing is a big deal. We're counting on you. And uh, it is hard for me to do, but that's what I, I just sit there and I just focus. Just focus on them. No, no. We've asked, we asked the questions on Monday. Everything's there. There were two or three of them I had to refine it. And there were some, there were some who, as I said, come back with a 20% goal because they thought they fixed their gross margin. They heard what everyone else was doing. And then on Tuesday, they come back with a bigger goal. And I just, it just makes me laugh. I will sometimes point out, I, that's bigger than, than yesterday. And they just, yeah, it's bigger. Uh, no, I just sit there. In fact, uh, uh, a lot of people come and watch these meetings. Uh, outside people come and sit in the back and, and observe. And we had some, uh, we get a lot of health care. Healthcare is doing some fantastic things right now. And uh, we get a lot of health care to come. And, and uh, uh, we, we always take a break halfway through, eat some pie or something. And um, we're eating pie. And there's these healthcare people came up to me and they said, man, I love the way you facilitated that meeting. I said, well, what do you mean? I didn't say anything. I know, that was so great of them. So yeah, I don't, I don't say anything. I just, just listen. So, OK. OK, there's one last piece to the puzzle. And um, that is, so I had planned to start doing questions at, at uh, uh, 9.30, but we've been going along, right? You won't have anything to ask after we're, we're done, I'm, I'm guessing. OK, so, so now let's talk about accountability and follow-up. So on um, every Tuesday and Thursday after lunch for an hour, uh, my executives and I, we go visit a team. We spend an hour with, with a team. And um, they're scheduled out so that we're hitting every team twice during the, the five-month period. Um, well, three times, right? Because then we do the celebration with them at the end of the period. But twice when they're reporting to us. And the way that works is, uh, and then we also do a Wednesday, uh, two Wednesday afternoons for a second shift. And um, the, um, we begin by telling them, we show them a chart that shows them gross margin for the company. We start with safety, I should say. We start with safety, the safety goals. We show them the gross margin chart and talk about how we're contributing to gross margin. Uh, and then we show them a sales chart, shows them how the sales are going for the company, and talk about profitability and so forth. And uh, everyone's engaged. And gross margin is all, for our business, gross margin is all supply chain manufacturing. So all of my budget items, all their costs, all of that is, is gross margin for us. And they know that. And so we, we're talking about how to fix, how to, how to keep gross margin up. And it's tough, because for us, uh, products are shifting. Right into different times. Gift cards are come on strong. We don't make as much money on gift cards. So if, if people use a gift card, our gross margin goes down. So all of my people know if products are going to shift to gift cards, we got to make more money on the other lines to keep the gross margin up. All our people know that and are struggling to hold gross margin up. Um, we talk about all that, and then the teams tell us, here's our tar condition. This is how we're connected to strategy. Uh, this is what our lead metric is. This is how we're doing on the lead metric. Uh, sometimes they'll tell us how they're doing so far in the lag, but it's so hard to, to manage during the five-month period. We often don't hear about how the lag is doing. Focus on the lead. Uh, they talk about their safeties. Uh, they talk about their improvements, and we'll do some show and tell. Whatever they want to show us, 
we do it. We do a lot of walking around and so forth. And uh, uh, that whole meeting is just about uh, affirmation, positive, accountability. You guys are doing great. And so my whole team, you know, if we see something we don't like, nobody says a word. We have something we disagree with, nobody says a word. The whole point of the discussion is, uh, you don't have to pretend, <laughs> you guys are awesome. You guys are rocking it. You guys are doing incredible things. And uh, I, we always turn away and walk away from that meeting with just amazement. And they love to amaze us. And, uh, and when we walk in, they love these meetings. When we walk in, they got grin. They can't wait to do this. And um, uh, my chief engineer, every time we're walking away from here, uh, chief engineer says, that's our secret sauce. That's the secret sauce. That meeting is our secret sauce. I said, I know Rex, you said that Tuesday. <laughs> well, I'm just saying. Uh, I think this is a big deal for us. Uh, just reminding them that, that you do great work. And uh, all right. We give them an hour. Uh, the one yesterday went about 35 minutes. 35 minutes. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. So it's the whole team. Yeah. And sometimes it's, a, it's combined teams. It might be, a, it's actually, it's always a group leader's teams. So there might be like two emblem teams here or two, uh, two acrylic teams here because they report for the same group leader. So in the course of the events, uh, both teams will report to us about what they're doing. They'll hear each other. And, um, yeah, so it's usually eight to 16 people. It's on the floor. It's right in the middle of their team. Because then, then they can say they can say something, and I can say, well, I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, come here. Let me show you this. And we're on the floor, you know, looking up at stuff. And um, yeah. I have seen in those meetings, I have seen, I have seen new employees uh, stand back and just look in amazement. And it almost feels like they're, they're you know, I, I, I know them all, I've met them all, but this is the first time they've, they've seen this sort of situation. And, and I see them almost watching, like trying to understand, why are you guys so excited about what we're doing? And I think they're looking for some sign that we're faking it. I, I, sometimes I see them, they've kind, of, they kind of got this quizzical look on their face, like, what is going on here? That only happens once. And then the, the next meeting, they're like right in the middle of it. They want to show stuff. There was a hand over here. How do you deal with team differences? Okay, so I do not visit, I do not visit for strategy deployment uh, a team in Toronto or, or a team in London. When I go there, we spend a lot of time on the Gemba. And maybe I'm there when they might be reporting on their strategy deployment. But that, I leave that totally to the local leader. It's a great question. Do they do the same? Yes, they do. Yeah. I hope they do it well. I think they do it well. Yeah, throughout the day, every day. In their huddles, they talk about ideas. In their team meetings, which are 30 minutes every week, the team meeting is designed for problem solving. Uh, so they do some of it there as well. But I remember something Scott said a couple of years ago. Uh, Leopold, uh, he was saying, I want you to do this improvement kata every day. And someone says, well, I can't do that. I don't have 30 minutes or I don't remember what the time period was. I'm going to have to let something go. What should I let go? And he said, I don't care. You know, you decide. And, and somehow they did it. They figured it out, and you don't even know whether you, you didn't miss it. <laughs> That's kind of the way I feel. Yeah, I don't care when you do it. Thanks for doing it, though. I love, I love that story. Not a question, a comment, maybe a realization. Uh, one aspect that you said was Mr. Kim believes that beauty brings more joy to people than anything, so he set up an environment. Yeah. 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 The, the second thing was uh, you said it. Um, there's a concept of employee longevity that's hardwired in the organization. 
Yeah. You've been there 30, 30, 30 years this January. Right. Where are they going to go? That is a unique position. Yeah. I, I, think, I think any of our leaders could go anywhere and just be a superstar. But that's a lot of work. <laughs> you know, you all know. It's a lot of work trying to drive change in organizations. I mean, they can drive change here. And it's fun, and it's easy, and uh, we don't lose anybody. Yeah, we don't lose team members either. We 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 have we are low single digit turnover, and it's almost all retirement. Yeah, so people stay. Uh, to your point about Obert, uh, Mr. Tanner. Uh, so uh, the executive team uh, chose our goal a couple of years ago. We're going to hit half a billion in revenue. That's, that's what we focused the whole strategy around, half a billion in revenue. And we took that to the board, and, and the board was very excited, especially the, the chair of the board of Zions Bank, uh, Harrison. It's a great goal, a great goal. And Carolyn, uh, our chair of the board, who is Mr. Tanner's daughter, um, she wanted to know, how, how are your people going to react to a, a revenue goal, half a billion dollars? How does that play with the people? Help me understand. And Harris was trying to talk her into it, and people were doing this. And Carol was just, you know, she wasn't impressed, and she kept pushing. And we were, we were relentless. And so she, she acquiesced. And uh, so we're the company meeting in December, and we present the goal, half a billion, you know. And it's kind of a sexy kind of thing. So, so people are kind of jazzed by it. And then Carol gets up at the end of the meeting, and uh, she says, I love these leaders. You, we have such great leaders. And they get so excited about like revenue and profits and things like that. And they've got this half billion dollar goal that they're excited about. And you know what excites me about it? I'm thinking that's half a billion lives that will be touched by our products. That's half a billion companies made better with our services. That's half a billion awards that are making the world a better place. And the people went crazy, you know. Half a billion dollars, the stupid goal. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. All right, oh, golly, uh, are we doing okay? So wait, I got three minutes. Let me, um, let me just say one other thing, two other things. The first one is, um, uh, we, we put the true north out there because it's easy when you're working to suddenly look up and realize you're not pointing north and you can accidentally go the wrong way for a while. So we just want everyone to always turn back north and just keep taking tiny steps towards perfection. And we've just defined it as perfection. We want to be perfect. Never will attain it, but let's keep moving towards it. And even when they get a 15%, 20% gain, nobody says, well, I just gave you. What else do you want? They always say, let's go get some more. Let's keep doing it. Let's keep going. So the true north works well for us. And then just the last thing I wanted to leave you with is a picture of one of our teams. Um, uh, I love this picture because um, this shows the strength. This shows the strength of our people, I think. Um, I mean, look at the confidence in their eyes. Uh, I believe that these people know what to do to make the company better. And I trust them. And they know that I trust them. And I think, I think part of this, this whole idea is, is recognizing the, the incredible, astonishing power that comes with humanity and the possibilities that are out there. And, and as leaders, I think it's our responsibility to respect that humanity and to give our best to help people uh, do what they can do. Because if you believe that, then as a leader, you go to the Gemba to see and to talk and to help them do their primary job, which is continuous improvement. Um, I think it's a very important work that we're engaged in, and uh, I wish you much success in all that you do. Thank you very much.